starting off in the U.S. Uh, with those U.S. earnings seasons uh, now well underway, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase came out with uh, disappointing numbers, not on the earnings share front. Uh, of course, credit losses is what's really hampering that company. Yeah, and people obviously wondering if it's going to spread to the rest of the sector. Um, I'd more look at Bank of America. But I think if you want to look um, for the kind of the yardstick, the, the one that will perhaps... Um, be more reflective of the broader economy in the US and globally, uh, rather look to those GE numbers, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, are this Friday. Uh, Intel was, was pretty pleasing, indicating that on a business front, people are starting to restock. And when the consumer comes back, um, I think that bodes well for many of the technology stocks that seem to have weathered this quite well. Of course, it is about U.S. earnings. It is about those numbers. Uh, Sasha, again, when we look at the, the J.P. Morgan Chase numbers, top line revenue growth slightly disappointing. So is this going to be the key theme uh, with these earnings uh, that are underway? So everyone's going to be looking at revenue growth rather than whether they've made a profit or a loss. Yeah, interestingly, um, Intel did beat slightly on that score. So you're starting to see it happen. I'd say it's way too early to be able to get a consensus number. So maybe by the end of this week or even better by the end of next week. So give it a couple of weeks and see whether or not you are starting to see companies grow revenue. Expect it to be nothing more than, I said, 2 to 5%. Um, but I think you probably will see that this season. In South Africa, we set to start uh, seeing those numbers coming through into f in February. Uh, we've had a few trading updates. Anglo Platinum said that they could see a headline earnings per share loss of 99%. And this is, of course, despite higher sales volumes. It's all about the, the platinum price in RAND terms, isn't it, Sasha? Yes, of course. And, and, and remember, volumes are, are lower. So we're comparing it to a period where there was an all-time platinum price high. And then basically uh, the price lost. 65-70%. Um, I was jokingly uh, at, a, at a lunch yesterday afternoon and the Anglo Platts um, corporate finance guy walked in and I said, where have you been? You've been hiding in the toilet. <laughs> I think what you'll probably see um, going ahead is people's expectations on the motor vehicle front because of course half of platinum sales are into the AutoCAD market are improving beyond people's expectations. So. I guess if you rewind a year and we were having the same conversation, we wouldn't expect 11.4 uh, or 11.3 million units to have been sold in the US because at the time people were saying oh, they're going to struggle to do 9 million units. So quite a big beat in inside of 12 months. You know, you can argue largely driven by cash for clunkers and all sorts of uh, cheap money programs um, and incentives. But I would say have a look at where it is growing really quickly and that's in China where obviously motor vehicle demand and they do have to meet those emissions control targets interestingly um, is expected to grow another 10 percent this year so you'll probably see beyond 15 million uh, units in China so do I think that's going to stabilize no I think that's going to continue to grow so comparing to a very good year with an exceptionally tough set of um, operating circumstances. Maybe that's not the right way to go about it. Maybe we should take a three, four year view. So would you be buying Anglo Platts at these levels? We know that the platinum stocks have had a very good run and really have uh, been tracking that platinum price. But when you see a trading update like this and you know the earnings are going to uh, be relatively disappointing, I suppose it's all been priced in at this stage, but also the good news has been priced in, hasn't it? I preferred stock in the sectors in parlor. I, th I think you're right. You know, the price you're looking at right now obviously doesn't reflect, and, and you, you, you were you know, pretty nice in, in, in saying the numbers are going to be fairly disappointing. They're going to be rubbish. So I, I think if, if, you, you know, if you look at the price right now and you're predicting earnings, you're saying, why is the price trading at this level? Because you're probably going to see volume stabilize and higher RAND prices for platinum and so these prices are predicting what's going to happen so in other words, to you next the December to uh, depreciate against No the I don't dollar. expect it I expect volumes to pick up and the, the platinum basket to steadily increase so I think and and and, and of course it is all about um, growing volumes because traditionally the big four have always disappointed on the production side You mentioned China of course China's reserves uh, increased by 23% last year to You'll nearly 2.4 trillion dollars yeah and I noted a, a blogger who, who had a fascinating take on it, and he said, yet we still think of China as an emerging market. So when are people going to say, well, China's a developed market? I suppose it all depends on 
you know, they've got masses of people and when they reach developed market standards, such as South Korea did a couple of years ago where the IMF said, okay, well, this is not a developing country anymore. This is a developed country. That's probably a good 15, 20 years away. But it's fascinating how the world has changed in just a decade. You know, I mean, a decade ago, if you rewind, um, and this was just before the, the term BRICS was coined, uh, people wouldn't have been as fascinated in, in emerging markets. And I think it's good globally because obviously what it means is more consumers uh, through the middle class is able to, to obviously buy each other's goods. So I, I suspect for this decade you'll probably see that. And then another term I've seen thrown around, I don't know if you've heard it, mavens, which is Mexico, Australia, Vietnam, Indonesia, Nigeria, and where the S, South Africa on the end of mavens. And you'll probably see more people chasing those assets because they believe the story, mm. growing middle classes globally. Where does that leave the developed economies when we look at consumer prices in the US uh, rising 0.1% in December? So inflation not a problem, Barack Obama imposing a levy on banks, uh, a spate of economic data and really just showing that some of the numbers are bottoming out, others are just staying relatively volatile. So a lot of debt that has been incurred as well, consumers still under pressure, unemployment high in Europe and the US. Where do you see those markets going if the emerging markets are going to be doing quite well? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because the way I see it, if I can use a soccer analogy, I would say, okay, there are five teams in the premiership and suddenly we've added five or ten at the bottom end and they're making their way through the top. So obviously the news you and I consume, which is English news, which is reflective of what's happening in Europe and the US, isn't very rosy. But I bet if we had to switch our channels and there were business news channels like there are this one in Africa, we're yet to see a very, sure, last year and the year before were pretty poor, but we're working off a relatively low base. I mean, all you have to do is turn on your TV at night and watch what's happened in Angola. Fifteen years ago, that place was a basket case. You know, now you've got their ability to be able to build these massive stadiums and host these uh, wonderful events simply because of their um, oil revenue. And that's what's going to drive our continent specifically. Um, and that's what's going to drive investment to our continent. So, you know, amongst all the doom and gloom in the developed world, I think in the developing world, things are still pretty good.